Hello and welcome to the culmination of the Tulsa City County Library's 2020 Books to Treasure program. My name is Laura Rayfield. And as a ch Children's Services Coordinator for the library system, I'm thrilled to welcome all of our virtual friends to the final presentation of our 2020 Books to Treasure illustrator, Zachariah O'Hora. Now, before Zach speaks, I want to recognize a couple people and give you an easy task to uh, check off your to-do list. First, the Books to Treasure program started 18 years ago in 2003 because of the singular and generous support of the Anne and Henry Zero Foundation. Judy Kishner, the daughter of Anne and Henry, has been a tireless supporter of the library and young people in our community. And we thank Judy Kishner for her generosity and her vision. Next, uh, Kimberly Johnson, the CEO of the Tulsa City County Library System. She has long been a champion for children's literacy and a core supporter of the Books to Treasure program. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, Kimberly Johnson chose our illustrator for Books to Treasure and the book that every second grader in Tulsa and Tulsa County will receive as part of the program. So we thank Kimberly Johnson for her leadership and her good sense. Now, what's the task, the easy task you can put on your to-do list and check off? It's simply to go to the library's website, tulsalibrary.org slash kids, to learn more about the Books to Treasure program. That's also where second graders in Tulsa and Tulsa County can go to apply for their special Books to Treasure library card, which will be mailed to them because of the pandemic. Now, because we're having this presentation live streaming on YouTube, if you have any questions for our illustrator, you can put them in the chat alongside the screen or in the comments. And after the presentation, Zach will take your questions and answer those at the end. So now, as they say, sit back because you're at home and relax and enjoy our a very fun and entertaining presentation by our brilliant 2020 Books to Treasure illustrator, Zachariah O'Hora. All right. Hi, everybody. How's it going? My name is Zach Ryohora, and I am broadcasting from deep inside my secret lair that is uh, a place. Um, it's actually, to be honest, it's just a shed behind my house, but uh, I like to call it Fuzzy Town because uh, everything here is super, super fuzzy, okay? And you can see I got some super fuzzy friends from some of the books here. And you know, if you're, uh, you know, let me know if he sees just someone flying by and you know, uh, it's always gonna be a little fuzzy guy and one of my little friends here. Cause that's, that's where we all hang out here in fuzzy town. Um, so I wanna give you a little tour here. Not many people usually see even this much of it around my head because uh, I, I'm usually here by myself and a, and a couple, you know, just special assistants. Um, um, so I'm very excited to share with you, uh, I was going to read through Horrible Bear, and we're going to talk a little bit about uh, how I became an illustrator and author. And I wanted to share uh, a book of my own that I wrote, because sometimes I write the books as well as illustrate them, and talk a little bit about the behind the scenes, uh, you know, what goes into putting these books together. And like Laura said at the end, if you guys have any other questions or as you're thinking of them, Put them in the chat, she'll collect them and I'll do my best to answer them uh, at the end of the presentation. So uh, here we go. Let me just share my screen here and we'll talk more about Fuzzy Town. All right, Fuzzy Town. Uh, so I've always liked to draw and I, I've been drawing ever since I was, you know, it, it, the second I could hold a pencil or a crayon, I was drawing on stuff. And uh, this is one of my favorite, probably one of the best drawings I've ever made. Uh, when I was three, it's, a, it's supposed to be a chef or a cook. I don't know if chefs make hot dogs. He's making hot dogs. I don't know, maybe he's just a cook. But hot dogs are my favorite food when I was three and four. 
And um, I made this picture. I was so proud of it that, um, you know, Amy, of course, gave it to my mom as a gift and was, you know, very proud of it. And when I handed it to her, she started laughing. And I was wondering, I was like, why is she laughing at like basically the best picture I've ever made? And um, then she pointed out something and you guys probably can see this here um, at, towards the bottom. The cook has three legs. I don't know what I was thinking. I, I've never met anybody with three legs. I've met dogs with three legs, but never people. Um, and, you know, so she thought that was pretty funny. And I don't know, I just got carried away and, you know, I was having so much fun drawing the legs that, you know, I just, I don't know. He's got very ample hips. So maybe I thought he needed three. But I have this up in my studio because it reminds me that um, when you're using your imagination and you are making up your own little world, and, you know, in my case, I call the world Fuzzy Town. You can do anything you want, right? If everyone has three legs or tiger tails or I don't know, uh, you, anything you can think of. Uh, nobody can say that that's wrong. And that's a beautiful thing because there's not too many other parts of life where you can just do anything you want. And using your imagination and drawing a world is one of those places, maybe one of the only places. Uh, I got my start um, as an author. I'm a reluctant author. I find writing extremely, extremely hard. And some people think that writing children's books or picture books, I try not to call them children's books because they're picture books for everybody. Um, you know, it's, it's not too many words and, you know, there's a lot of bad books out there, surprisingly. Uh, and, you know, how hard can it be? Like, and it turns out it's really hard, or at least it's really hard for me because, you know, every word that you use, you know, you need it to be exactly the right word to keep the story going. And um, so it takes lots of practice. And um, the first time I ever wrote a whole story uh, and I made a book was in third grade. And it was, this is the, the book, it's called Barney and the Basketball. And you'll see that I went back and I wrote the title of it again below in cursive once I learned a little cursive, uh, which I don't know how to write in cursive anymore. So that, that's, that's a lost artifact there. Um, so I'm not gonna read you this whole story because it's my first story, not very good. And basically it's about a kid named Barney who has a basketball and some bullies, all B words, a lot of alliteration there. Um, Cause I see a line here, it says, those bullies are bad boys. Uh, they pop his basketball. And I don't even remember how, it, um, how they solved it, but you can see I made some little illustrations there. And for some reason, I still don't know why to this day, um, maybe I was the only one that finished the book, uh, it won an award and they had a, um, an awards night um, at a different school with all the different third graders that came and I went to go accept my award. And when I first walked in the place, um, I noticed they had a giant table full of beautiful, beautiful donuts. And when the person there realized that I was one of the authors, they said, look, you can have as many donuts as you want because you're a winning author. And that's when I realized I need to grow up and be an author because if they get paid in donuts, whatever job that is, that's the job for me. So, and as it turns out, in a lot of my picture books, there's donuts in, the, in there. And I had forgotten about this. That just kind of happened naturally. But I guess I'm just uh, very driven by donuts. I mean, who isn't really? Uh, so this is a picture of me when I was like second. Oh, wait, that's not right. I didn't have a beard back then. I forgot. Uh, this is a picture of me in about second grade, maybe. Um, and I say maybe because I'm not totally positive. You see that shirt? My grandma gave me that shirt for Christmas one year uh, when I was in first grade. It was my favorite shirt. And so, of course, being my favorite shirt, I had to wear it for a picture day. Uh, and you know what? In second grade, it turned out to still be my favorite shirt. So I wore it again for picture day. I don't know how my parents didn't notice. And then I squeezed into it in third grade and I wore it again for picture day then. So all of my um, school pictures from elementary school I'm wearing the same exact shirt in every single one. Um, the only difference is it's different missing teeth. And that one, based on that tooth, I think that's second grade. Uh, but now I have two sons and they inspire my books a lot. Uh, I, had their, I have a son, um, now they're 11 and 13. Uh, Theodore, we call him Teddy, is 11 now. That's the guy in the Spider-Man jammies right there. And Oscar, my older son, is 13 now. Um, he's reading No Fitz Nielsen, and that's because uh, when he was a little kid, he threw such crazy fits that uh, he was kind of like uh, my character Nielsen, who's a 900-pound gorilla who throws giant fits when he doesn't get his way. Um, he's the inspiration for that. Um, other inspiration I have for my books, 
and to help me around the studio around here, this is Niblet, um, you know, who went on to sort of star in a book called uh, Niblet and Ralph. And uh, he likes to lay on all my paintings, uh, you know, before I can send them off to the publisher. And sometimes they're not completely dry and he'll kind of walk across them and there'll be, you know, paw prints, niblet paw prints all over my studio and or hair in my painting. So even sometimes they make it into the book. I've noticed books later that have been published where I look real close. I'm like, that looks like a hair in there. And it is. And it's it's undoubtedly it's either niblets or it's this gal right here. This is a, this is Betty. Um, and she's very inspiring for Fuzzy Town because she's very fuzzy. And this is basically what she does all day. She cleans herself and she takes naps and she's just super cute and fuzzy. And that's very inspiring for what I do. Uh, and now I, I have a third uh, employee. This is Waffles and um, he's super cute too. And uh, I actually just uh, finished a book that's gonna come out in the fall, um, loosely based on a very fuzzy version of Waffles um, about a very fuzzy uh, dog who uh, rides around on a skateboard and sort of spreads good cheer and happiness and uh, community and fuzziness. Um, the only problem is that he, uh, humidity is his worst enemy and uh, he has a bad hair day and that causes some problems. But uh, the whole thing's kind of dedicated to waffles and you can see why. Uh, and this is where uh, I'm broadcasting from. I guess this is broadcasting, live streaming. I think that's the word. Uh, this is my studio outside uh, behind my house. That's my bike there. And I take that bike down to the local uh, book and uh, toy store all the time, character development, um, to go down there and just see what new books they have, sign books of mine and uh, check out all their good toys. So uh, you, never find, you never know what's gonna be inspiring down there. Um, so I'm really pleased and uh, excited and honored that Horrible Bear was chosen uh, by the Tulsa Library Program. And this is one of my favorite books. Uh, it was written by Amy Dykeman. She's a great author. We've done three books together. This is the second of the, of the three so far. And she actually has, if you get a copy of this book and you look in the back and there's some author photos back there, she actually has blue hair, pretty much almost the color of this book, which is kind of funny. Sometimes it's purple, but that's a true story. And uh, I think she's a great writer. I really enjoy illustrating her books. Um, so one thing, uh, sometimes if, they're, if it's in the publisher's budget, they'll let us do, uh, you know, kind of custom end papers, and I'll, I'll do some extra paintings for those. And for this one, I thought it'd be fun to do um, the crazy hair of the girl of, uh, from Horrible Bear. And what's really great about it is that, you know, if you're reading this book to a friend, you can hold it up and, uh, you know, you can kind of act out and be that person pretty easily. It's like a nice, uh, you know paper wig. Um, and on the last, uh, the last end page, you could be the bear too, if you're kind of feeling like you want to be the bear that day, or you want to be the girl, depending on your energy level, she yells a lot, you could be the one. So just kind of a little bonus fun there. Uh, Horrible Bear, written by Amy Dykeman and illustrated by me. And this uh, came out on Little Brown uh, and Company's uh, publishing house. And there's a little girl here and she's flying a kite. And as you can see from the picture, the line of the kite has snapped for some reason. And that kite is flying right up to that cave up there. See what's it, if there's any, you guys think there's anything in that cave? I, I think you're, I think you're right. There's definitely something in that cave and it's a bear. And he's taking a nice bear nap. A girl peeked into bear's cave. She reached, but he rolled and crunch, uh-oh, broke her kite. Not that he meant it, he's clearly asleep, right? And she climbs right up on top and she screams in his face, horrible bear, the girl shouted. Not a very nice way to wake up, is it? So the girl stomped down the mountain and she, while she was stomping, she yelled, horrible bear. And then she stomped through the meadow. Horrible bear, she shouted, and she ran right through a, a nice little picnic there for Mr. Goat and uh, his little uh, lady friend, squirrel right there. They're trying to have a nice little, little picnic. That's not very nice, is it? And she stomped all the way home. Horrible bear, she yelled. Now, bear was indignant, and that's just a fancy word for feeling like you've been, you're a little mad because uh, someone accused you of something and it's wrong. 
I'm not horrible, he said. She barged in. She made a ruckus. She woke me up. How would she like it if Bear got an idea? It was a horrible bear idea. You can tell it's a horrible bear idea. He's got that horrible unibrow. You can tell if someone has a horrible bear idea, just look for that unibrow and you'll know they're up to it. Bear practiced barging. He practiced making a ruckus. He practiced waking someone up. Horrible bear, bat squeaked. Perfect, bear said. So here's a lesson here, I think. Uh, if you're horrible, it's catchy, right? Bear stomped out of his cave. And the girl stomped in her room. Now, if you look really close out the window of the girl's room, you'll see the bear coming down the mountain. And I want to point out a couple of secret Easter eggs. I'm sure you guys know what Easter eggs are. Um, and I don't mean Easter eggs like the good chocolate ones that you get on Easter, but uh, Easter eggs that you'll find in stories and movies and video games and books. Um, and that's when an illustrator can kind of hide little just little fun things uh, for people to find uh, or just to amuse themselves. Sometimes I put stuff in that is not funny to anyone else, but I think it's funny. Um, and if you look real close, uh, Wolfie the Bunny, which is the first book that Amy and I did is on the shelf in her room. And so is my first book that I wrote and illustrated, Stop Snoring Bernard, which is about a snoring otter. So she's got good, good reading taste. But she was too upset to nap. So the girl tried drawing and she ended up drawing a bear. Horrible bear, she screamed. She tried reading, and of course, the book she picked, Goldilocks and the Three Bears, and she yelled, horrible bears. She tried talking to the best listener she knew. That horrible bear, he broke my rip. Uh-oh. Suddenly, her stuffy couldn't listen as well as before. Now, her stuffy, if anybody's read uh, Wolfie the Bunny, you may recognize that stuffy is um, Dot the Bunny from Wolfie the Bunny. So she's got a different color hoodie on. Um, but that's another little Easter egg for, you know, real eagle-eyed readers. Uh, do you guys think that she meant to rip off her uh, the ear of her stuffy? I don't think so. It was definitely an accident. I didn't mean to, the girl cried. Oh. Now, what do you guys think that the girl uh, thought here? Or what did she realize? Did she realize that uh, the bear actually didn't mean to break her kite? crunch her kite i think she did she knew it was an accident but uh it's too late because the bear's on his way down the mountain isn't he meanwhile bear stomped down the mountain rah 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 and he stomped through the meadow poor mr goat rah 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 and he stomped straight to the girl's front door with a giant rah that's pretty scary right giant big bear coming to your back door through the clothesline and everything looks pretty horrible and the door opens. I'm sorry, the girl said. And all the horrible went right out of bear. Now, I'm sure this has happened to you and your friends. Like, have you ever been mad at a friend and then they made you angry, but then they apologized for what they did? You can't say mad at them, can you? You got to forgive them, right? Of course. That's what friends are for, right? Bear patted. He wiped. He got another idea. It was a sweet bear idea. Thank you, bear, the girl whispered. Look at that. He took the clothespin off of his ear that, you know, from running through the clothesline and kind of put together the stuffy back together. That's, that's a nice gesture, right? And she had a sweet bear idea, too. Look at that. She gave him some flowers, which is very nice. I mean, who doesn't love getting flowers, right? Even big bears. Bear and the girl skipped through the meadow. And they gave the flowers to Mr. Goat and his lady friend. They're having tea there. That's nice. They bounced up the mountain. And together, they patched everything up, even the kite. And if you guys look here, there's a couple more Easter eggs. I'm going to point one of them out. If you look on the wall of the cave, there's a nice, uh, there's a little picture of Wolfie the bunny. And there's a couple more Easter eggs in there, but I'll leave, I'll leave those for you guys to find next time you read them. Nothing was horrible at all for the moment. Munch, munch, munch. And look at that. Mr. Goat is eating the uh, string of the kite, which, you know, we all know goats will eat anything. And what do you think the girl will say when she sees this? And she's going to say, horrible goat. Yeah, that's right. And maybe that should be the ne our next book, Horrible Goat. What do you think? All right. So that's Horrible Bear. And I hope you guys read this a million times more once you get your own copy. Uh, I want to show you guys a couple um, early pictures that I made when I first got the manuscript. And the manuscript means the word the words part of the book, because uh, Amy wrote those, so I didn't write those. 
And after I read the manuscript, I had to I had to decide, you know, what do these characters look like? It just says bear and it just says girl. It could be anything. They could look like anything. It could be a polar bear. I don't know. Um, and so these are the first sketches that I made to kind of figure out what these characters would look like. And with all characters, uh, you know, even professional illustrators, the character you see in the book or like the ones next to me, um, th those are a result of drawing them over and over and over and really practicing. I, I don't think anybody makes up a, a character just on the first drawing. It, it takes a lot of refinement, a lot of redrawing to kind of figure out, you know, what the character is going to look like. And uh, my original idea I was thinking that the girl's crazy red hair would kind of be like her, her mood, you know, so it would just be this kind of overcast cloud that would cover her face and we would never actually really see her whole face through the whole book. But uh, the publishers kind of said, you know, we have to see her face. So, which actually after the fact made, made more sense. Uh, so I'm glad we changed that. Uh, this, is a, this is a painting of the actual cover of the book. I paint all my books with acrylic paint on paper, on printmaking paper. So the printmaking paper is a very heavyweight paper um, that holds up to all the wet paint and doesn't buckle. And it's also flexible for when the publishers have to scan it to turn it into a real book. And um, uh, so it, it's just kind of the perfect medium. Uh, and, you know, I'll do the back cover and the front cover all in the same thing. And then sometimes I'll digitally do the lettering or at least ink it separately. And then we put it in together in Photoshop. That way we can resize it and move it around. But that's what the artwork looks like before it turns into the book. And I also found this. I, I made a painting um, of the case cover of a book. And um, you guys, I'm sure you know what a case cover is. I didn't know this until I was probably well in my 30s. But um, so outside the book, you know, you got your dust jacket, right? You got that paper thing that you know, immediately your little brother or sister rips it as soon as and starts eating it as soon as you bring the book home. Uh, and that protects the book underneath. And the book underneath this part, that's the case cover. And uh, in this case, we decided we end up, um, sometimes they make it the same exact thing as the outside dust cover. And sometimes you can, you can uh, do something else with it and make some extra artwork. So in this case, we made the kite the girl's kite, and if you look at on the front of the book, it's kind of perfect. And then the, the one on the back is all taped up and, uh, and fixed, because this one's after it got crunched by the bear and after they fixed it. So that's kind of another fun little Easter egg back there. And one of the ideas I had before was to make, um, is to do the what I'm showing on the screen, which was uh, sort of based on an old uh, kite ad for French kites. And because Amy Dykin wrote the book, I made them Dykeman plastic kites. And I uh, ended up just giving her this painting as a, as a gift after we finished the book. But uh, it was kind of a fun, just a fun idea to, to think through. Um, so I want to read one more book, um, The Not-So-Quiet Library. This one I wrote and illustrated, and it's kind of based on real life. Um, and it's about these two brothers here. One's a bear, because remember, this is our imagination. We can do anything we want. So it can be a bear and a human could be brothers. Like, why not, right? So we'll see what happens here in the not so quiet library. And that is a very, very giant foot right there. The not so quiet library. Look, these these brothers they read a lot of books because look at how look at how many books that the dad has to put up on his car to return. Um, it's a lot of books. It's great. Every Saturday, Oscar and Theodore got up bright and early, not to watch cartoons or play outside with their friends. It was the day they went to the library with dad, but first, first things first, they gotta get a proper breakfast, right? And what's a proper breakfast? Donuts, right? The answer's always donuts. Dad always said that a day of quiet exploration required a proper breakfast. My dad would do this. I'm the oldest of five kids and he would, you know, it was the 70s, so it was different, but he'd drop five kids off at the library after they've had donuts and we just went crazy for hours. I'm sure, I'm sure people didn't appreciate it. But all I know is I went back to my library when I was growing up and they remembered exactly who I was and exactly who my family was. I think the donuts has something to do with it. At the library, Theodore and Oscar returned their old books. They waved to Miss Watson and crept past old pickled onion, Mr. Tasker. They headed down to the children's department while dad headed up to the nap department. Your guys' uh, library have a nap department? It's, it's a good department to have. I recommend it. Oscar and Theodore were just settling in to another quiet library day when boom, crash, growl, shh, said Oscar. 
boom, crash, growl, knock it off, Theodore. And Theo sa Theodore says, it's not me. Here's a little Easter egg for you know, any grown-ups here. Uh, Theodore is reading 36 Chambers of the Wu-Tang there. If you, any Wu-Tang fans out there, I don't know. Maybe there's some second graders or Wu-Tang fans. That if you are, you're ahead of the game. It appeared there was a monster in the library. Boom. There's a monster in the library, screamed Oscar. And Theodore says, I told you it wasn't me. Because it wasn't. It was a monster. They couldn't outrun the monster, so they tried hiding. You better not mess with us, monster. My brother knows Kung Fu. Yeah, right. And they tried bluffing, too. And that's what they're doing there. Now, I don't know if you guys have seen the Karate Kid yet, but... Uh, you know, that's the one move, the crane kick. That's the one move that Theodore knows. He didn't get that far into 36 chambers yet before the monster showed up. They even tried trapping the monster. And if you look really close, they're taking staple, staplers and trying to staple the monster's feet to the ground so they can't chase them. But that just made him even angrier. They're going to need a lot bigger staples than that. Growl! Good idea, though. The only option left was diplomacy. Now... Diplomacy, that's a fancy word. That's a tough word even for adults because diplomacy is a really fancy word for the art of talking things out. Something that we all seem to forget how to do when we get upset about something, right? So Oscar asks, excuse me, Mr. Monster, is something wrong? And the monsters yell, yeah, there's something wrong. We hate books. Oh man, who says that? Who hates books? That's, that's crazy. The many headed monster had tried everything to make books taste good. Chuck tried mustard. Yuck. Seymour topped his with whipped cream. This book tastes terrible. Winston swallowed his book whole. Gulp. Pat tried hot sauce. Probably too much hot sauce. And Bob used sprinkles, but they just bounced off. I should have picked a soft cover, said Bob. Library and humor, right? Okay. Actually, said Oscar, books are for reading. What? You mean this whole restaurant is filled with things we can't eat? Are they in a restaurant right now? No. Nah. They are in the library. This is one very mixed up, hangry monster. Maybe it gets low blood sugar. I don't know. Well, we'll just have to eat you guys instead. Grab the sprinkles, Winston. Winston says, finally. Wait, says Theodore. That's when Theodore remembered something. And he's getting a nice little sprinkle shower there. Uh, donuts. Remember I said the answer is always donuts? Well, once again, the answer is donuts. I need a drink of water here. Hold on. Now, it looks like he stashed uh, some donuts left over from breakfast and just happens to be enough for all the monsters, uh, which is great, right? That means that the monster is not hungry anymore and um, they won't eat the kids, right? Perfect. You guys will taste great with donuts on top, the monster said. Uh-oh. Yum, yum. Hmm. Thankfully, that's when Miss Watson stepped in. Story time, everyone. Please sit crisscross applesauce. Applesauce? I like applesauce, said the monster. Mmm, story time. That sounds tasty. Luckily, monsters like story time as much as they like donuts. Sorry about that whole, uh, you know, gonna eat you thing. That was just a low blood sugar talking. I don't know what's better, this book or this donut. Books sound so much better than they taste. I'd agree with that. You guys ever tried eating books? I think books sound a lot better than they taste. This one next, please. Now, I want to let you guys in on a, another secret Easter egg here. Now, Miss Watson's reading a book. Has anybody read The uh, Watermelon Seed? A few of you? You have? Good, good. It's a good book. If you haven't read it, you should read it. Well, it's written and illustrated by a very good buddy of mine, Greg Pizzoli. And if you look in his books, I try to put him in my books, and I try to put, he tries to put his, my stuff in his books. And that's just kind of a fun thing that we have. And uh, I just saw him the other day. I don't know what he's working on now, but he's a great illustrator and author. After story time, the monster promised to clean up the library. Besides, Miss Watson could really use some help reaching the high shelves. And they're perfect for that, right? The boys promised to return for story time every Saturday after Bob, Seymour, Winston, Pat, and Chuck promised not to eat them. That's a good deal, right? And on the way home, Oscar asked, hey, how'd you know the monsters love donuts? He asked Theodore, and Theodore said, I read it in a book, of course, right? But I and that's how the not so quiet library became quiet again. All right. And uh, I got to do some other fun stuff with the end pages for this. So we, on this last end page, we can see that the monster is holding up to his end of the bargain. He's helping to clean up the library. And he's very cheerful because he's not hungry anymore. So he's saying, good morning, Mr. Tasker. 
Mr. Tasker, not a morning guy, kind of like myself. He's just like, Ugh. Um, I wanted to uh, show you guys a couple behind the scenes uh, scenes of this book because this whole library is actually my childhood library that I grew up in. And um, I originally grew up in New Hampshire in Manchester or Manch Vegas as the locals like to call it. And uh, um, so we went back and I hired a photographer to take a bunch of photos of the library so I could use them. And originally the idea was um, I was gonna paint over the photos, the black and white photos, my characters and actually have them in my childhood library. Well, I started to do a whole book like that. And the publisher was kind of feeling like all the backgrounds were a little dingy and gray and you know, something about the, the black and white they didn't, they didn't really love. Um, you can see there's a photo there just on the street. And this is the actual library. I'll show you guys. That's the actual front of the library. And if I flip back and forth here, you can kind of see that it is the actual front of the library that where they're pulled up, which would basically be on the sidewalk. Uh, but the publisher decided that, yeah, it wasn't really exactly what they're looking for. So they asked me to kind of redo half the book, which I wasn't super happy about it, but I just went back to what I normally do, which is paint the whole thing. And I'm pretty happy with how it came out. But before that happened, you know, I, I sent in some cover ideas and, you know, covers are very important, right? You, they always say, uh, don't judge a book by its cover, but guess what? Everybody does. So, um, so a lot of sketching and a lot of uh, working out the details of the covers happens behind the scenes before you see the final cover. And I might for any book, um, on average, I probably draw and, you know, sketch out maybe six to 20 different cover ideas um, and then we pick one of those and we refine it a few times until you come up with the final um, cover and I hate to say this but like some you know just like with records and CDs um, a lot of people are, are looking at the cover of the book on Amazon or you know in a small little little thing and not always in it, seeing it in the store so ha it's there's, the covers really have to pop in ways that they didn't used to have to so we always end up kind of making them as simple and bright and powerful as possible. This is one of my early ideas. And this is, that, that's the, uh, the main uh, checkout desk at, at the library where I grew up. And this is one of the other ideas I had because I just love those guys like huddled under the library, the return cart. Um, I thought this would have been a great cover and it was kind of one I was pushing for, but um, the one they decided, this is kind of an early version of it. And you can see it's pretty close to um, what the final one is. We, we changed the type and we just made one giant foot instead. Uh, now something kind of amazing that happened uh, while I was doing this, this is the first time I've been back to my childhood library in like 20, literally 20, 25 years. And um, as I was going around, I remembered that um, there used to be what I thought was a magical hallway to the children's department. And it was magical because it was not only it was curved, but it also had um, all these paintings, um, alphabet paintings on either side. So I really felt like I was going through a magical portal to the part of the library that was just for me. And I loved walking through it and looking at all the pictures. And so I asked the, the head librarian, uh, you know, what happened in that hallway? Am I just imagining that wrong? She's like, oh, no, that hallway is still here. We just changed where the children's apartment is. And it's a storage closet now and I'll get you the key, we'll open it up. So she went and got the key, she opened it up and there it was. And I couldn't believe what I was seeing because I hadn't really remembered the details of it, but for the letter, the letter N for nightmare, there is a monster. And that turns out that monster looked a lot like the monster I made for the library. And I'd already done the sketches for it. You know, it was just so far deep in my subconscious maybe. Um, it's kind of amazing to see it. Like I must have remembered it on some level. Uh, so that was even a kind of an amazing surprise uh, for me as well. And uh, later I found out that the, uh, the head of the library, that was her boyfriend at the time when he painted this. And this was in the seventies. So, you know, a long, long time ago, you know, 1900s. And uh, he finished his painting and got paid and then uh, ran away to California after that. And, uh, but I'm glad he left the painting behind because uh, it was a big part of my childhood. Um, so that's the not so quiet library and horrible bear. And um, if anybody has any questions ready, get those in the chat. And um, I'm going to switch my screen here. It's going to take me a second. Uh, I was going to do a couple drawings if we have time. And um, uh, <laughs> or, or or if we don't have time, you know, maybe I'll do one quick drawing of a character. 
uh, just because that's fun. And um, just give me one second here. While I switch over. Laura, how are we on time? We good? We're good on time. I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to jump in. <laughs> before she that's all right. Do we have any questions yet? Uh, has there been any? We, we do, yeah. Okay, great. Um, I'm gonna do, uh, I'll do one drawing and um, I'll show you how I draw the, uh, the girl from Horrible Bear. And then uh, I'll try to answer as many questions as I can. Uh, so hang on here while I just uh, go to quick time player and we start a new movie recording. And let's see, then we share the screen. Let's see if I can get this rolling. Hang on a second. Why is that? I look at that. Now this is the one part I had no problem with until until now. Uh, I'm gonna stop my sharing here. Hang on one second, guys. Give me one second to see if I can get my. Why is it not choosing my technology? People making life easier, right? Isn't that the deal? <laughs> All right, let me give this one more shot here. Make sure my iPad's on. Now, usually uh, I paint all of my uh, books, like I was talking about. Um, but occasionally I, I did a series that is coming out in Britain first. And I think it's supposed to come here. And they did not want to have to deal with paintings being sent over to London. Um, so I did um, do everything on my iPad for those books. And I'm kind of finishing them now. Okay, what is... Um, and uh, but I, I really like to paint everything instead, and that's what I'm trying to trying to get going on here. And it's not cooperating. Uh, <laughs> okay. Perhaps that's something we could share um, and for video later. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm going to stop this because for some reason it's blocking my camera from showing you my iPad. So I apologize for that. You just have to enjoy the, <laughs> the drawings are already done on the screen. Um, and we do have video from earlier today. If anyone's really interested in, in seeing them, um, you can go to the libraries. Um, I imagine their Facebook page or the webpage, Laura will tell us, and you can see how I draw those characters then. Yeah, so we, we, we had a school presentation earlier this, this afternoon, which will be on the library's YouTube channel. So what you're watching on right now, youtube.com slash Tulsa Library. Well, Zach, we do have um, a, a couple of questions that I think um, you'd be interested in answering. Um, one that's not, actually not in the chat um, is from uh, some kid friends of mine, um, uh, Evan El Elizabeth McCartney. Evan wants to know, do you ever start a book, get bored, and then not finish it? And I think that <laughs> comes from his experience. Yes, that happens all the time. Um, you know, sometimes you think you have a, a great idea and you're very excited about it. And then you just hit a spot in the book where it's not really working and you have to put it away for a while. And there's been ideas that I've had to you know, like put down for a couple of years and where I couldn't finish the whole thing and then have to go back and, and really work on it. And, and sometimes it just takes time and let your brain work it out in the back, but that happens all the time. Good, good to know for all yeah. of us uh, frustrated or unfrustrated artists and writers. I would add to that too, that, you know, you only see the books that end up get public, you know, that get published, right? Um, for every book that, especially for the ones that I've written, I've probably sort of pitched and written 
and did partial illustrations for, you know, for each one of those, I'm probably pitching three ideas and two ideas often get rejected. Sometimes all three get rejected. So rejection is a part of the thing. You just have to keep, you know, you can't be too precious about just having one idea. You just gotta, you know, put it aside, maybe come back to it, promise yourself you're gonna come back to it. Um, but a lot of people, you know, you just see that you have a book out and they're like, they think it's easy and it's, it's not easy. And there's a lot of rejection involved for everybody. That's good. So I, I have to ask this question. It's the last, the last one so far, but it's a library question. Yeah. So you used your library as a kid. Do you still use your library? Oh, all the time. Um, I've, I've done a lot of programs with uh, the Philadelphia Free Library, and uh, I live two blocks from my town library, and, um, you know, uh, I'm there all the time picking up books, and, you know, when my boys were littler, you know, in the middle of winter, we just needed to get out of the house. We always went there to pick up movies and, uh, and, and books all the time. That's the correct answer. <laughs> That's the real answer. That's, the, yeah. <laughs> That's good. So um, a couple other questions. Um, have you ever gotten inspiration from video games? And do you have any favorite video games from when uh, you were a kid? That's a, that's a great question. Um, I feel like that's a setup. That's how good of a question it is. Wow. Um, <laughs> I do like video games. Um, I don't play a lot of video games now, but um, probably my favorite one right now is Mario Kart. But from when I was a kid, um, Probably Galaga or Centipede or Miss Pac-Man. Those are my favorites. Um, but there's a lot of uh, other video games in between there that I do enjoy. Uh, I'm working on a book right now called, um, I think I can say it. Uh, it's called Blips. And it's a nonfiction book um, by, uh, I can't think of the author's name right now. But it's about Ralph Bayer, who, who is the guy who, basically invented home video games before no um what's his name i was gonna say noah baumbach but it's not noah baumbach um noah the guy that uh created pong so this guy like came up with the device first and became the odyssey and then at a computer gaming convention um the guy that started pong saw it and i don't know if they got a copy of it and they reverse engineered it and made pong because it's a very similar kind of tennis game. And this is about kind of his whole struggle, uh, you know, where he had a day job, you know, kind of figuring this whole thing out. And at the time, TVs were new, because this is like through the 60s and, you know, even in the early 70s before he really had the idea. Um, and people couldn't understand, like, why would you ever want to play a game on a TV? Like, that makes zero sense. Um, so he got a lot of rejection. And, uh, and then finally, with a couple other engineers, ended up creating basically the template for every single home you know video game device that we use today so i have a question about your office how yeah. long have you had your office did you have a hand in the bill do we have a very jealous uh possibly home builder himself <laughs> <laughs> to know uh, so it, i've had it for three years and um it is you know i live in pennsylvania right by philadelphia and there's a lot of um, Amish companies who build are like expert shed makers. So I hired one of them and um, they basically came to my backyard and built it in like two days. And I was able to customize it a little bit. Uh, you can see above my head, right? I guess my camera's opposite. Um, there's, I had these uh, transom windows and, um, and like a large eave. So I have um, a lot of head space. Uh, even though if you remember the picture of the outside of my studio, it has, it's not quite an A-frame, but it has pretty sloping, low hanging roofs. Um, and I added another one so I have plenty of headspace uh, in, in the middle of it. Um, but, you know, I, di I didn't build, I don't have those kind of, uh, those kind of skills. Um, but it's, it's pretty great, especially during the pandemic. It's been a lifesaver. Yeah, here's a question. Um, so you talked about finding inspiration from your childhood. Where do you find your inspiration as an adult? Um, so some of the inspiration that I get as an adult is thinking back on my childhood. Um, some things are, um, you know, to be honest, uh, often uh, I make uh, cards with cute animals, um, cute fuzzy animals. Usually I have to send to my wife 
sometimes just for holidays or sometimes just uh, I'm sorry cards. <laughs> and I find that those work, the, the cuter the animal, um, the better they work. And, um, and I get out of trouble. Um, and a lot of those characters end up being characters from my books. Um, so I'm always scouring the internet and that's why Instagram is great. Um, it, you know, I follow a lot of like cute raccoon um, uh, accounts and stuff. And um, so cute, cute pictures of animals on the internet, uh, my, my own pets and my kids all have inspired me to make different book, book stories. Okay. Um, so a couple more questions. Um, do, so you were reading the Not So Quiet Library. Uh, yeah. We had a question while you were reading. Do you think all the monster heads have different voices or the same one? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I actually think if it was like a professional person reading the book, they should have different voices because they mm -hmm. definitely have specific personalities, um, which you kind of see by what they're wearing. Like some of them are a little angrier. Some are a little not so angry. One of them already likes books and one of them's kind of a hip hop uh, head and so definitely they have different voices. Kind of like siblings in a family. Yeah, that's a good. <laughs> in it, family monster. So I have a, a question here about Easter eggs. Yeah. And I'm gonna piggyback it with a question I have about Easter eggs. Do you plan those Easter eggs? When did they come out? Uh, when you decide to do them, but also do you did you find inspiration for Easter eggs in other books? Um, I mean, I really love noticing little details and that stuff. And, um, you know, I, uh, Richard Scarry's Busy Town is a big influence on me. And I just remember, loved pouring over those books as a kid. Like, they're not actually real linear stories, you know, those books. And I, I found that out the hard way as a parent because I wanted to read them to my sons. I was like, whoa, 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 these are way too long. Like, you need to go to sleep. And there's not even a story here. But I just love looking at all the little details and, you know, I wouldn't notice, you know, like just trying to find like um, Goldbug, the bulldozer bug or Lowly the worm or different characters. And it just gave you every time you open the book, there was just new stuff to discover. And so I do try to put that in my books, but most of them um, aren't there in the sketch phase when I'm when I'm painting it and I'm sort of adding details to the background. Um, that's when I end up adding in the Easter eggs and stuff. Um, unless it's an obvious thing, like with horrible, uh, with horrible bear, I knew it would be fun to make the girl stuffy look like dot from Wolfie the bunny. And I did those two books at the same time. So Wolfie the bunny was on my mind and putting Wolfie the bunny in that book in a couple spots that was actually kind of planned. Great. So I have a, a question from another kid friend of mine. I believe this is Elizabeth. A question, why do you like writing? <laughs> I actually don't like writing. Um, I think it's really, really hard. Um, the upside to writing your own story though is you can write the kind of stories that you like to illustrate and um, you can uh, kind of just go anywhere with it and kind of have more control over it in a way, uh, which is really fun. But on the other hand, I like illustrating other people's books because I don't have to write them. And, but I can imagine um, totally different things than the author imagines. Mm -hmm. And bringing those to the story, it's very, it's really fun when you come up with stuff and then the author is even like, oh, I didn't even think about that angle of the story, but you brought it out. And, you know, it's a true collaboration. Um, Wolfie the Bunny is kind of a, a good example of that, where if you guys are familiar with Wolfie the Bunny, um, it's a bunny family that adopts a, a baby wolf that ends up on their doorstep. And mm -hmm. the little girl is afraid that the wolf's gonna eat the bunny family and the parents are kind of oblivious. Uh, but the whole setting is in, um, in an urban environment. And just, if you look at the words, it, uh, it could be anywhere. And the author intended it to be in the woods and they go to the carrot patch to get carrots. And I made that like a co-op. Mm -hmm. And we had just moved out of Brooklyn um, it's actually based on our old neighborhood there. And there's a, a you know, grocery store co-op um, there. That it's not called the Carrot Patch, but um, so it, it was just kind of fun to put that, that particular story in that environment. And it was completely 
couldn't be more opposite of what Amy had in mind when she wrote it, but it ended up working. Great. Well, do we have any other questions? Anybody else want to share in the chat? Uh, we did have, there was a comment um, with your original idea for the Not So Quiet Library. They really liked the pictures of the old library, the black and white. Oh, nice. Thank you. I, 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 it's cool looking too. I, it's very nice to hear that because I, I was I was hoping to do the whole book that way. And we'll just have to save that for another book idea. You have a lot of librarians who would appreciate that book. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, well, it looks like maybe that's all of our questions right now. Um, gosh, we want to thank Zachariah Hora for his amazing presentation and for sharing his creativity and his inspiration and, and uh, his life with us virtually. We're, we're sad that you weren't able to come to Tulsa now yeah. yet well, you got to invite me back another time i would love we will to come. definitely invite you back um i wanted to remind everybody that you can go to tulsalibrary.org slash kids and go to books to treasure our second graders out there in tulsa and tulsa county uh you can apply for your special books to treasure library card that has the horrible bear and the little uh the uh, little red-headed girl um to to uh, get your card in the mail Sorry if you're not a second grader, you can't get that card. And kids will be getting copies, their own copies of Horrible Bear uh, this month and next month at their schools and at our branch libraries. But thank you so much, Zach. We really appreciate it. I'm going to hold you to, I'm going to bring you to, to actual Tulsa. Please do. I would Tulsa. love to. Thank you guys <laughs> so much for choosing Horrible Bear. It's a real honor. And thank you for having me. Uh, even virtually. And I, I, I look forward to meeting in person and uh, talking more books. Fabulous. All right. Thanks so much.